Okay, thank you so much, Deray, for uh, inviting me to be on today. Um, I'm just going to try to go through um, kind of a combination of the two presentations I've provided to the um, the COVID task force at the house level. And um, a lot of the data came from some of our larger like suppliers and wholesale distributors. So it's all um, sort of like aggregated, um, which I think is helpful because it provides kind of a larger picture of what's happening in the food industry across, across a lot of different sectors. And um, our members are primarily a grocery store members. So, um, but our, our suppliers supply um, a lot of restaurants and a lot of hotels. So um, our membership has been really impacted um, negatively by the virus um, because of the closure and the loss of volume at the hotel level and the restaurant level. And a lot of our convenience stores have also been forced to close um, due to low volume. And because they're in tourist areas, there just isn't traffic to maintain the store being open anymore. Um, so just kind of a, the, down, the downward trend continues this week. Um, grocery stores are starting to look pretty similar to pre-COVID levels, which is sort of surprising considering the, the amount of volume loss in the other channels. Um, we're not seeing the increases we saw in the previous two weeks when people were sort of stocking up, hoarding, whatever term you want to use, uh, <laughs> depending on who you are. Um, we've seen a lot of C-store closures, especially in shopping malls and tourist areas. Um, and we've seen a lot of layoffs um, show up in food industry data. Um, and we've, across the state, seen a lot of layoffs. We've seen unemployment um, skyrocket. And that shows up in food data because you see people buying lower quantities, you see people buying lower value items because they don't have money to buy food. Um, and if you look at the demographics of Hawaii, um, Ulu Pono just shared this worksheet with me, you can see how Hawaii is a place where we're gonna be hit very hard by this economic impact of the virus because we have a population, a lot of which is already sort of living on the edge. and when we're in a situation right now where people are waiting three weeks to get their unemployment check, um, a lot of people are worried about hunger, and we're very worried about hunger. Um, and and that's you know something that you know we're working with the Hawaii Food Bank and and other um, charities with because we really obviously do not want to see a large um, portion of our population experiencing hunger um, during this time. So um, you know just. Looking at food service business, it's, it's even lower than the week that we saw prior. Um, just, you know, Restaurant Association can give a deeper dive on this, but um, the takeout order system is not um, making up for the volume that used to be experienced through dine-in. Um, many hotels have closed and restaurants have closed and even food service items, which is like deli and fresh items served in the grocery store, in some cases are down as much as 60%, which to me indicates that people don't feel safe unless they're cooking their own food in some cases. So um, suppliers are also indicating that their higher margin outlets, um, or have, which were the restaurants and the hotels are down. So their income is down about 30 to 60%. And these are suppliers that also supply groceries as well. Um, so that's kind of a shocking figure. Um, as such, we're seeing additional layoffs on the supply side as, of the food chain as, um, as well as the food service side. Um, and many of these layoffs actually occurred before the passage of the CARES Act, which I can talk more about if people have questions on. Um, but essentially, a lot of our members don't um, will not be granted access to the CARES Act because they have more than 500 employees and they're not in a designated um, code, which was granted exemption from the 500 employee limit. So um, in those circumstances, really, the only thing that's going to happen will be mandatory layoffs um, because you can't stay open when you've got a 60% loss in revenue. Um, so um, just continuing down, this is like more um, sales level data. Um, we're seeing sales slow down on most items except staple grocery items, which indicates that people are rethinking how they're spending a limited amount of funds. The heavily shopped and hoarded items um, 
are going to come back. We we think that those are going to come back like this week to somewhat normal levels. Um, and that the manufacturers that had limited their SKU production to focus on boosting protection for the high volume items, they're starting to bring these items back on. So you'll start to see a little bit more diversity. Um, but Hawaii does lag a little bit behind that um, due to the amount of time it takes for us to get product from the mainland. Um, the other message that I've been told to get out there is really to encourage people to only send one person when they go grocery shopping. Wear a mask when you go grocery shopping. Uh, I think pretty soon that'll be mandated actually. Um, and that helps us get people in and out of the door quickly. Um, when you just bring one person per family, um, we're going to have limited store hours because we have uh, a shortage of staff and we have staff doing more things than they used to do. So right now we have employees that their whole job is to wipe down the cart once it comes back. Their whole job is to wipe down the store continuously. Um, their whole job is to count people coming in and out of the store, making sure we don't have too many people. So that's like an additional at least three or four employees, depending on how large the store is, um, doing these types of sanitation and safety precautions. Um, so we also have seen a really tremendous increase in applications for SNAP. And we're advocating at the federal level for them to increase funding for SNAP to increase the mandatory minimums on that um, because that's a really good way to get money back into the economy. And for people that had already been in the SNAP system, it's almost uh, immediate. So you don't have that really long drag wait time that you do on the unemployment check claims. Um, so we, we're hoping that that will be in the second um, CARES Act, which is hopefully going to pass sometime next week. Hopefully by Monday, we'll see. Uh, fingers crossed, because the um, payroll protection program that a lot of people have, um, a lot of the small businesses have signed up for, is already looking to run out. It's about to run out of money because so many businesses have applied for support. Um, so we are also seeing more and more um, protective measures um, taken to ensure that the essential food workers are safe. So essentially um, a lot of plexiglass barriers for cashiers and, for, and enforcement and compliance with social distancing as well as encouraging masks for consumers. Um, so let's see. We're, we are basically requesting that more testing be available um, for our employees, but also for the general public. And um, we really believe that that is the solution to this, that we need to do mass testing and we need to really seriously quarantine the positive cases. And then eventually we will be able to get out of this and go back to some form of normality um, we have such a small population in this state where we might be one of the only states that could actually get this under control pretty rapidly if we're able to do mass testing and we're able to really get the positive cases quarantined. Um, so that's that's the big focus that um, that a lot of the people in the business community are working towards is just getting the testing out there available um, so that people can know whether or not they're positive because a lot of times you don't have symptoms and you're out there spreading it around um, and that's why we're asking people to stay home um, and we're also asking for you know additional funding from the federal government um, for cdc approved child care for essential workers with the uh, closure of the public schools it's been very difficult to stop the stores and um, it's been very difficult for the essential employees to come to work, not just in the food industry, but also, um, you know, our friends in the medical industry as well. Um, they also need childcare. So um, that's another really big priority for us, um, as well as the increase in, in SNAP funding. So um, that's pretty much all of the stuff that I had written down to talk about, but I'm happy to talk about anything else if there are questions. Thanks, Lauren. Um, we have about 32 participants, so I'll just allow people to unmute themselves and preferably put on video if, you, if you're down with that, and then um, ask Lauren any questions directly. Before we go into that, Lauren, can you just share some specific clients you have so people have a, a kind of a more specific understanding of who you represent? So we represent um, convenience stores, grocery stores, so like ABC store, 7-Eleven, grocery stores like Foodland Times, um, KTA Superstores, um, and then we represent suppliers and distributors and wholesalers 
and shippers. So across the board, like Matt's and Young Brothers, their members, um, a lot of the large wholesaler distributors, which you guys probably wouldn't know the names of unless you're in the food industry and then, but they're massive companies and, um, and a lot of um, like produce distributors and, and those types of members. Yeah, anybody across the entire um, supply chain. Not an easy job, <laughs> <laughs> especially right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any questions, please? And you're welcome to also put it in the chat too and we can discuss from there, but you're also welcome to unmute yourself. I did also, maybe I'll hit on the fact that I, because we hear a lot about people who are concerned about food shortages. Um, there's really no reason to be worried about food shortages at this time. Um, we do anticipate full replenishment. Um, the reason why it looks kind of like there's a food shortage is because in the beginning of this, there was such a massive run on product. That's why you saw the bare shelves. And we're still trying to make up for that. But the issue is really that we can only, um, get in the amount of supplies a certain amount of supplies and a lot of these items are on allocation nationally because there are shortages for like toilet paper and hand sanitizer and things like that so we're actually still getting in that product um it's just that it's going out the demand level right now is so much higher than it normally is it's it's that's why it looks like there's a little bit of a shortage but there's no reason to be concerned or worried about a shortage of basic food supplies One question I'll ask while we wait for others to think on some is, um, do you feel comfortable with the trajectory that the that our government officials are on in terms of testing uh, and and just like mitigating the situation or are you trying to get them to um, be more bold and, and take more action? We would like more testing and, um, you know, we've been very open about that and I know that they're limited, you know, just like anyone else with supplies, but we do have a very small population here and we have we have a population that's easy to contain um, and I think if you look at you know what countries like New Zealand have done where when they say there's a 14-day quarantine they mean there's a 14-day quarantine and they take people to a government site for the quarantine and I think that's how you really stop the tourists from coming you don't let them go to their VRBO or their hotel. You send them to a government site and they're not like that. You know? Not very, com not as comfortable. <laughs> yeah, not as comfortable. Um, and, and like once we get that under control, I think mass testing the population, mass tracing of all of their contacts, of all the positive contacts, um, we could really get this under control in two weeks, you know, if we, if we actually quarantine all of the positive cases. Um, but the problem is right now, we probably have a lot of asymptomatics walking around thinking that they're not doing anything wrong, potentially infecting other people. Um, you know, maybe they're essential workers or, you know, or maybe they're just going out to get things that they need. But um, if they knew they were positive, they probably wouldn't, hopefully would not be doing that. Um, and so, you know, that's how we really, stop the spread and um and then once once that happens we can reopen the local economy which is a big deal um and then obviously the second step is going to be tourism and that's another reason besides hawaii's financial demographics um that make us very vulnerable another thing that makes us very vulnerable is our extreme dependence on tourism and that you know, 20% of the population that used to be here no longer here. That is, people are starting to realize how impacted they are by tourism. I think a lot of um, people didn't really realize how much their business was impacted by tourism. Um, whether it be, you know, people staying in VRBOs and communities that you wouldn't necessarily associate with tourism, that volume is gone now and people are seeing that and it's hurting them um, across every sector. So, um, you know, eventually we do have to get the tourism industry back. And, and one of the ways to do that is through testing and, you know, through testing people when they come in and to make sure they're positive or not. And, you know, that obviously will require a lot of testing. But I think that on a national level, they're really ramping up the production and, and hopefully Hawaii can be on the cutting edge of, of being extremely aggressive on testing.
We have two more questions that came in in the chat from Gwen. Are there any new opportunities for Hawaii agriculture or food businesses? Yeah, so um, I've been working with uh, the Hawaii Farm Bureau and Ulupono and a, a few other groups trying to, because the farmers, just like all the other suppliers um, that I mentioned, they're really hurting because they have been supplying probably predominantly um, higher volume accounts for obvious reasons like restaurants and hotels. And with those gone, they're really hurting to find a market for their product. And so um, we are trying to get the volume up in the grocery stores. And I know the Farm Bureau is, is doing a lot of, of programs as well. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're supportive of, of increasing purchasing of local farm products and, um, and, you know, supporting the farmers in any way possible. Um, because they're definitely, Tom can probably talk more about this, they're definitely hurting because of the restaurant closures that are happening. It also seems like, I mean, my friends work for and started Oahu Fresh and they're like a CSA delivery program and it seemed, and there he's like, we've gone gangbusters. He's just like, it's nuts. They're hiring more and more people and trying to just stay on top of the hundred something percent, several hundred percent increase in demand. So I think there are opportunities when it comes to like being able to imp like create a delivery system. So yeah. Um, one more question is, what other restrictions or action is government considering in the next 30 days? Do you foresee any long-term legislation that might affect our industry? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we really a lot of times find these things out when the press conference happens. So um, I, I don't really know what they're planning on. I'm hoping that their plan is to increase testing dramatically. Um, and contact tracing and, you know, try to work on reopening the economy once we get the spread under control. And actually our numbers yesterday, I haven't seen the numbers for today, but the numbers yesterday looked really good. Um, I think we only had seven new cases. So that's really positive. And if that continues, then I think we're in a, a better, much better place than was predicted. So, um, you know, fingers crossed, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, but it could also just be that less people are testing, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, our hope is that we can reopen the economy eventually and, and get people back to work. Because uh, the federal government, I think, is realizing they can't just subsidize, you know, all of these unemployed workers forever. It's, it's a lot of money. I have, a, I have a comment about that, too. Um, I, I think that the restaurant industry is expecting once we get you know, back to looking at reopening, that uh, there'll be more, um, you know, potentially there'll be, uh, you know, health department restrictions or mandates that, that staff wear masks while they're serving customers, and that uh, table spacing in restaurants and seating will probably um, have to, you know, decrease the number of tables and increase the space between, uh, you know, tables and seats in restaurants, which, you know, is, is probably a very good thing for our health, but it's going to be very challenging for us to to deal with that in terms of increasing our sales. Right. We're expecting, you know, some legislation, I don't know legislation, but, you know, safe, safe, uh, safety requirements in that area. Okay, awesome. Thank you for jumping in there, Tom. So um, we're at 2.22, so I want to jump into Matt's presentation, knowing that um, when the question section comes up, you can ask questions to any of our speakers. So um, take it away, Matt, with, and you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mom. I see you on here. <laughs> oh, the mom's on Zoom. I've been loving that. All right. Can we see? <laughs> yes. Great. So my name is Matt Hong, and I am one of the co-founders of Banan. Uh, hopefully there's no typos on this. I made it right before. Uh, so what is Banan? Just for those of you who don't know and who's talking up here right now, um, we create a product that's a dairy-free soft serve that's made from locally grown bananas. Kind of looks like that. We'll serve it out of a cup, serve it out of fruit. We'll serve it on waffles made from ulu. Started it with some friends out of a food truck about five years ago. Um, and so this is us, you know, I represent one of the small businesses that's here on Oahu. Uh, we've made it five years into business now. We have four locations and one event truck on island. And we had a team of about 60 plus individuals. 
Um, and we also process around four to 6,000 pounds of bananas a week prior to COVID and coronavirus. Uh, on a happy note, while I have all you guys' attention, uh, we started a farm project with a man named Gabe Sachter Smith about a couple of years ago. And through all this chaos, this has been one really lovely update that the bananas that we've been in trying to grow for the past two years have finally fruited and just made it to our stores a couple of days ago. Uh, this is a variety that's supposed to be a bit more flavorful, but also probably more importantly, it's, most, it's more resistant to bunchy top virus. Uh, which is pretty prevalent here in Oahu. So just wanted to slide that in there as some positivity through all this. Um, the impact on our business so far, we have only nine of around 70 still employed. Um, we're currently open at two of four of our locations, Kailua and University. And we are closed at our Waikiki and Kahala Mall locations. And similar to Tom, as we mentioned uh, before, everybody probably hopped on we're down about 70% compared to the same 30 day period uh, in 2019. And sometimes we'll see sales on daily sales at least dip even lower. Uh, we haven't paid rent yet. Most of our landlords have thankfully allowed us at this point to at least defer for two to three months and we'll see what happens when, when we get there. Some adaptations we've made as a small business uh, we've now started to offer curbside pickup. Uh, you're capable of ordering online or uh, paying via phone ahead of time, and we will come out to your car and keep our distance, uh, as well as a delivery service. Um, within our locations, we've started to, we've, we put in plexiglass barriers at the two locations that still are open, face masks for all staff, and uh, well at the beginning of this we introduced sanitizing wipes uh, just to be making sure to clean any commonly touched surface. Current projects that we're working on through all this you know bits of suffering um, is we're trying to increase our online orders. Uh, as you guys saw it's a frozen product so it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, we're not serving delicious warm Thai food that probably everybody's seeking out right now um, but uh, working with Bite Squad, and we also offered a delivery service our own for a little bit. Uh, it's it's actually been working out quite well, um, at least as, as it gets to customers. And uh, we're also something we've already were investigating prior, but now it's kind of speeding things up a bit. We're looking into expanding into consumer packaged goods, um, not necessarily for wholesale, but something just to be served out of our store. You know, imagine a pint of banana that. Uh, customers could pick up or selling some of our macadamia nut honey butter in jars. So any way that we can try to increase revenue, um, you know, these have certainly been testing times, uh, but I love my partners and I think we all are coming at it with the same mentality that uh, as sad and, you know, tragic as it is and certainly tragic for people out there in the world, um, we, we've been approaching at it with, with some excitement and trying to make what we can out of the situation at hand. Uh, another update, uh, we, were, we were previous to coronavirus, uh, a pickup point for FarmLink Hawaii, which is a local produce delivery service. Uh, they now deliver right to your homes, but they can waive the delivery fee if you pick it up to select uh, pickup spots, uh, us being one of them in Honolulu. Uh, they have a massive, massive wide array the biggest array of veggies, produce, meats, dairies that, that you can probably get on island. Uh, their business is up over 500% because of all this. So they have to close their online market. Um, so you have to get online and get there right when they open it if, if you want to uh, have your go at filling up your cart. Um, but we serve as a pickup spot, and which has actually been really nice because their business has been going up. So they've actually paid us a little bit, uh, which is helping to you know, cover future rent and, and just current expenses, uh, as, as well as it really helps us because it directs those 80 to 90 customers each time to also potentially order um, and we can make some sales on that. Uh, I just put this slide up in case there's any other small businesses that are watching. 
I haven't been as involved in the process for applying to these loans. That's my partner, Zach Barry. Uh, bless his soul for doing all that for us. Um, but he's actually on a webinar right now with the third bullet point, Team Save Hawaii Jobs and Businesses. Um, but ASB and CPB have been banks that have been very helpful and very communicative through the process, he tells me. Um, the Hawaii Small Business Development Center is a resource that we used prior to this, and they've been coming in handy again. And this is located in Manoa for anybody who has never been there. Uh, and these guys are out there to help us small businesses. So if you have any question regarding these applications, please reach out to them. And then lastly, as I mentioned, uh, Zach is currently on a webinar right now with Team Save Hawaii Jobs and Businesses, which, which is a mix of professionals uh, and accountants uh, who are helping to guide small businesses along the way. And, and if you don't want to even Google search it, you can just email that email right there, that uh, address right there, questions at braingainhigh.com and to get the ball rolling if you have any questions regarding these loans. Uh, lastly, this is my last slide, how the community can help at least us and I you know, assume this reflects other small businesses that are uh, trying to stay open through all this, uh, is number one, if you're gonna visit our store, please wear a mask. Um, you know, we, as we installed the plexiglass barriers and we've done the mask for our own employees, as this first started, uh, when, when, when this was first starting, we were certainly concerned about our customers' well-beings, but even more than that, uh, because uh, even seeing dropping sales, I mean, sa sales dropping and things like that weren't as concerning as thinking about the well-being of our own employees. Um, so we really want to urge you to, if you are going to come visit, to wear a mask uh, and help protect them and should eventually, you know, should help protect our community. Uh, but even before wearing that mask into our store, uh, we actually prefer that if customers would pay on the phone or online through our online menu service, that way they don't even have to enter our shop. The only reason we've kept our doors open um, to allow for takeout is because there's customers that probably haven't received the memo ahead of time that they can order online or order by phone. Um, so we're still allowing for that, but we certainly prefer you to do curbside pickup. Another way to support us and other businesses is ordering on Bite Squad for delivery. Uh, purchasing gift cards, unfortunately, I, we don't have those up online at the moment, but I'll probably get them up there shortly. Uh, in our, it, it, for our case, uh, purchasing local produce through that, uh, the business farm link as i mentioned uh who are some good friends of ours uh once again I, I you know i can't emphasize enough that they have just such an amazing list of produce and so you can grab your produce and while you're at it you know come pick up a cup of banan uh and when you do visit us post pictures uh to social media uh just the more that we can get you know across people's screens that everybody's always on uh, the more likeliness they, that they might support us. Um, and lastly, also has some nice uh, fun news, is we just posted an Instagram quarantine giveaway this afternoon. Uh, so you can help the community and help yourselves, you know, help tag all your friends to get exposure for them while entering a contest to win things from us, from Ola Hard Seltzer. Uh, Jams World has some fabric masks they're giving. Malia Organics is uh, dishing out a bunch of soaps. Um, so that's how I will end my presentation now. And I'll, I'll open up for any questions that anybody has uh, in regards to a small local business like ourselves here. Thanks, Matt. I also want to give Matt a shout out because he's the um, their Instagram and photography videography guru. So if you see all that stuff, going up on their social media, which is really successful. That's all Matt, just tweaking the lighting and taking nice photos. And he even has his own music um, in the background of the videos that he makes himself. So he's a widely talented person and one of the co-owners of Banan. So super cool business. And thank you for providing, you know, a more specific instance of what your business is going through. I think that's really helpful. So please share questions in the comment box or go ahead and unmute yourself and um, you can ask Matt any questions directly. Hi, this is Mackie. 
Um, just as a quick thing, a, the uh, CDC has just put out this morning that anybody that doesn't show signs of COVID-19, but yet has been around people with COVID-19 that has tested positive can be at their work site, even though they have not shown symptoms. They're being allowed back at work and don't have to do the 14 day quarantine. This is in complete uncomparison to what our state is doing. So this is the Fed, the CDC that is coming out with this. And that just came out this morning. So that's in complete opposite from what our state is doing. And that is hitting the news. So I just wanted you to be aware of that because that's a complete opposite of what our state is doing. Thank you, appreciate it. There's also a question that came in for Lauren while Matt started. So the in Hawaii County, the plastic bag ban was halted temporarily. Do you think the bag ban trend might slow down or even reverse? Sorry, say that again, Dre? This was a question for Lauren about the bag ban that was halted temporarily on Big Island and many other places across the country, the plastic bag issue. So um, Lauren, I don't know if you can speak to that, if you've been yeah, hearing I, anything. Um, just reading an article this morning about California and it, it does, it looks like a lot of the counties, including San Francisco, have halted the bag ban for now. And the, the fees are sort of interesting because it's a state level fee in California um, and some of these large national chains have just come out and said, we're waiving the fee, which is technically illegal. But um, I guess they're just not enforcing it right now in California and probably not in Hawaii either, because I think that's what Target is doing here. Because um, Target's not allowing reusable bags in anymore. And I think a lot of other locations, um, including the commissary, the military bases um, are no longer allowing uh, reusable bags. Um, so I don't know if, I mean, I think, yes, as long as this virus is out there circulating, I think there'll probably be things like that happening. I don't know that it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, how long it lasted. I don't necessarily see it as a, a long-term trend so much as, I mean, hopefully we can get things under control with the virus. Um, but I can't really, see the future. Sometimes I ask doctors, like, how long do you think this will last? And they say two years. And I'm like, like, we can't survive two years. Like, we, you know, the economy can't survive two years of this uh, behavior and shutdown. So, um, you know, hopefully there'll be a vaccine or, or something, some type of treatment um, available. And then we will, you know, not be so worried about everything we have to touch. Um, like, I've seen, you know, web uh, videos from doctors saying you bring your groceries home or you leave the packaging outside and you wipe down everything you buy with sanitation wipers or you put it in a new container and you you leave all take all the other containers outside and and um i mean it doing that takes like an hour <laughs> when you get home so i mean it, yeah the, the the level of concern right now about surfaces and how the virus spreads on surfaces is really high because there is quite a bit of data that the virus lives on surfaces for um in some cases days uh whether or not the viral load is high enough to infect somebody after three or four days what you know whether or not it's traceable versus enough to infect someone is i think sort of the the point that people could argue about, but it, de it definitely lives on surfaces. Um, so it's it's something to, to think about. I will say also from um, Surfrider folks nationally are tracking the issue around plastic bans really closely and trying to figure out um, what's going on because there's been plastic pollution activists working on bag bans and other types of bans for 10, 20 years. So it's a devastating blow when, when regulations get reversed, especially in this case when, you know, HFIA and Surfrider are typically on opposite sides of worldviews in terms of plastic bans. But with the fee on plastic bags, we're actually able to have an agreement because it benefits businesses. It requires customers to think before taking disposables. And it's, I think Lauren said herself, it's caused an 80 to 90% reduction in use of disposable bags, which is great. Um, 
So our stance right now is that wash your reusable bags, right? Because a lot of places are still allowing it. I'm going to down to Earth and Cocoa where they're still allowing it. So I've been throwing mine in the washer every time I do laundry, um, any cloth bags, and then um, be okay with paper bags, right? A lot of places don't have plastic bags, but paper and plastic both come sterile. Um, and it's not clear which surface is worse at this point because there's so few studies on it. So um, we're, I think, out of an abundance of caution where, um, you know, we're okay with disposables just given the, the global crisis we're in. So, but definitely want to maintain our regulations and advocate for paper um, right now or we're washing your reusables um, as clean as much as possible. So thank you for that. And then Mackenzie, does everyone have the forms for the emergency paid leave um, for the FFCRA? Does anyone need it? Cool. She, so Mackie has the fillable form with instructions. If anyone wants to share their contact, then she can send that to you. Any right. other questions for Matt about Banan or any of the things that he shared? Okay, cool. Well, I do want to thank you, Matt, for sharing about the farm link. I think that's really cool that you guys are a drop off location. Um, and yeah, I also just want to share that there's a farm links pretty much like over capacity. And they're like, how do we keep up, which is amazing. And when I was talking to my friend, Matt Johnson, who started Oahu Fresh, and I was picking up my CSA at a six feet distance from him. I was like, congratulations, because I've known him for um, almost 10 years now. And he started Oahu Fresh around that time. And I, was, I told him, I'm like, I'm so proud of you. Your business is going so well. And he made a joke and he goes, yeah, it only took 10 years and a global pandemic. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that it's finally stuck, the, the farm fresh produce delivery model. So it's a great time to um, get a CSA box, um, get a delivery, or pick up at a convenient location like Banan, whether it's FarmLink, Wahoo Fresh, there's all these different farms that offer that. So definitely recommend that. Maddie has a question. Are you finding it difficult to stay an OFR during the pandemic? Uh, so we are currently not an ocean-friendly restaurant because we use uh, disposables that are bioplastic based. Uh, our food truck was because it was a mobile truck. Um, however, our current locations aren't ocean friendly restaurant approved. I guess another way to frame that question would be, um, are you switching back to plastics or are you kind of maintaining your use of compostables on site? Yeah, that's, that's a good way to rephrase it. Um, no, we're, we're continuing our same supply with our disposables. Uh, we find that that's not the most concerning uh, cost. Uh, and line item when we're looking at everything. Uh, we have a lot more of expensive ingredients, labor, uh, subscription services, other things that, that certainly weigh a lot more into that. So uh, switching to plastic utensils, uh, petroleum based at least, uh, hasn't really cost our, our attention. Awesome. I also wanna give a shout out because you guys use the wooden utensils, right? The blue utensils? We do, at least for the fork and knives for our Ulu waffles currently, yeah. Yeah, and so we're always advocating for fiber-based compostables, not the bioplastic if possible, and um, Banan's one of the few restaurants that uses them regularly, so they're wood-based local company called Blue Pencil, so definitely love seeing that kind of stuff. They're uh, great, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, Matt will be here, How? or do you have to jump off pretty soon, Matt? I'm probably going to hop off, yeah, so I can okay. head down the hill, yeah. And you're... These new bananas, are they on both locations, university? Hey, what's up, James? <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm knocking down a wall, so I'm multi <laughs> Nice. Wow, I missed you, James. <laughs> yeah, how are you both? Uh, are, are these bananas you're talking about, are they in both locations at the moment for the product? So, or are they going to uh, still? They're... They're currently ripening at our store, so they're still pretty green. They're just like a tinge of yellow on them. So I, I think it's probably going to be another couple of weeks before they actually hit the menu. But uh, yeah, I'll let you know when they come online that they're certainly a little bit sweeter and a little bit more aromatic. So, um, and we love our bananas and, and, and we, they're pretty good. Awesome. All right. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you, James. Okay, well, well, I'm going to share Matt's email here in case anyone wants to reach out directly. And thank you, Matt, for joining us. Um, and Thanks, Terry. Thank you so much. Thanks, business. everybody, for listening. <laughs> awesome. So next up is Tom Jones. He's the chair of Hawaii Restaurant Association, and I believe also with REI Restaurants, is it? Which includes Gyotaku. So please introduce yourself and share, share your presentation. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having us here today. Um, the, uh, uh, again, my name is Tom Jones. I represent the, all of the restaurants in Hawaii. We have about uh, 400 restaurant members that represent about 700 actual locations. And then like Lauren's um, organization, we also represent the, um, the suppliers and the service uh, industry that takes care of the restaurants. And that would be you know, food purveyors from vegetables to dry goods, frozen goods, fresh foods locally, also um, uh, you know, beverage vendors, and then there's paper suppliers and you know products that we use, saran wrap and paper and all kinds of different things, as well as our service industry that represents you know and, and helps us with our POS systems, um, uh, air conditioners, you know, kitchen equipment, things like that. So there's a huge you know um, industry network that is associated with the restaurant industry. It's not just you know about you know food, um, and so I'll we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, let me share the screen here. I'm gonna share uh, just some information about the um, uh, industry here. Um, the uh, restaurant industry or the food service industry, not including you know, the grocery stores, uh, represents about 99,000 um, employees or about 15% of the employment in the state. There's about 300, uh, 3,665 plus uh, eating and drinking establishments in the state and um, $5.6 billion. So we're a real huge part of the economy here. And um, right after the governor uh, you know, uh, asked us to shut our, our restaurant dining rooms, um, you could see the unemployment grew exponentially. And I think it's now getting closer to 200,000 people. But our industry represents a really, really significant portion of the unemployment sector right now. And so, um, you know, like Matt, I had to lay off um, about 80% of my employees because my sales went down by 80%. So two weeks ago, uh, about 140 of my staff, you know, um, received, uh, you know, layoff notices. And uh, it's really challenging because we work very closely with our employees and they're like family to us. We see them every day. The restaurant industry is a, a real it's a lot of people serving even way more people. So it's a very social uh, environment and um, being stuck at home for them right now, I'm still out and about a little bit, but uh, for a lot of our employees, it's real challenge being stuck in the house and not having all of that, that contact with their favorite customers and their coworkers. So um, it's, it's really gonna be something, uh, I think over the next two, three, four weeks, as we go through this process, my heart goes out to them. Um, Good news is, and I think one of the biggest concerns that employers and restaurant owners have had is, you know, we're, we're aware that there's a safety net for our employees that have been working, so they're going to be able to collect unemployment, um, and they're trying to expedite those payments, um, you know, as quickly as they can, but we have been reaching out to the state government and, and different industries to make sure that our employees are taken care of, and um, we got word from the uh, you know, the insurance, um, you know, providers, HMSA and Kaiser, that they're going to be very lenient with us about uh, keeping our employees on the insurance rolls. So, uh, my company, and I think many others, we're able to keep the, you know, the employees on and we'll figure out how to, um, you know, settle up with, with the premiums and stuff later on. But right now it's looking actually pretty good for us in that respect. So that's really important for us. I feel very good about that. Um, as far as um, food safety goes, um, this is a, you know, uh, a handout that came from the uh, University of North Carolina. But generally speaking, uh, takeout food is very safe to eat. Um, you know, the, the virus transfers on contact services, but not so much on food, particularly cooked food. And um, the state of Hawaii, I think, has done a really, really good job over the past, uh, you know, four or five years since they started the placard system of really inspecting the restaurants very carefully and um, more frequently. And so food safety has never been 
um, at an all-time high as it is right now in the state. So cross-contamination is an issue that we deal with and this, um, the virus is pretty much a cross-contamination type of an issue. So for the most part, uh, you know, takeout food is actually quite safe to eat. Um, it's, the, it's the pens that you might sign when you're you know, writing out your, your check uh, or signing your, your, your credit card slip that would probably be a, a greater risk than actually picking up a takeout item in the, in the restaurant. Um, so that's important for people to understand. Um, one second. So we encourage everybody to, to, to eat out and to take advantage of the uh, takeout offerings that are available at your local restaurant. Um, let me get back to the, to the sales information. Matt talked about his sales being down about um, you know, 80%. Uh, fast food restaurants are actually, because they're geared up for the takeout you know, type of operation, you know, they're actually doing pretty well. I think food, fast food operation sales are down uh, about 10 to 30% from what I understand. And um, restaurants that offer takeout, like my restaurants have, have always done takeout, our sales are down anywhere between 30 and 80%. So right now, our takeout sales has doubled over the previous year. Um, but unfortunately, our dining room sales is totally gone. So we went from 7.5% to 15%. Um, and um, we're at about 70% uh, right now, about 15% up to 30%. So right now we're at about 70%. Rest, and then other restaurants that weren't geared up for takeout, like my restaurant in Pearl Ridge, uh, Coromo, uh, have had to close you know, temporarily until further notice. So you look at um, Roy's and Allen's and um, some of these bigger you know, fine dining restaurants, they're really not set up to do takeout. So they're suffering, I think, the most because they weren't able to make the adjustment. And I'll touch base on the PPP program related to that in a minute. Um, but restaurants that, are, that have sales losses of about 70 to 80% right now are probably making just enough money to pay their staff. And because the restaurants are in a cash flow, uh, you know, high cash flow business, we're typically paying last month's bills with this month's income. So when our sales drops off this much, it's a real challenge, you know, to pay um, uh, any of our vendors. So not only are we struggling right now, but we're also putting an additional burden on those vendors that have extended credit to us. And um, for the most part, the local vendors have actually been really quite good about, um, you know, working with us to keep us moving along because they know that our long-term success is also their long-term success. So by and large, in the you know, in the restaurant community here, the local um, restaurants and the local vendors that have, you know, good working relationships are actually working pretty well together. And that would also include, I think, our, uh, our landlords. The local landlords are generally a little more understanding than um, some of the national chains or your malls and shopping centers. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I think that's going to be one of the big developments that's going to happen in the long run is, you know, landlords and leases and paying our rents. Um, once this starts to settle down, we're going to have to go back and look at, you know, how can we um, uh, deal with, you know, paying these rents. And we're not expecting, at least my take is that restaurant sales will probably not get back to 19, uh, probably 2019 levels until probably well into 2021. So there's going to be a real lag in our ability to, to get our sales back up, and that's going to hurt our ability to pay, you know, fixed costs like rents and um, utilities and so forth. Um, so in any event, I think the thing that, you know, um, you know, your members can do to help the restaurant industry the most would be to dine out as much as they can, but also too, um, I'm getting lots of requests from, from friends and from um, uh, other businesses to buy food from our restaurants and then donate that food to a needy or worthy cause. So we've had people picking up food that they're actually picking up 20 or 30 bentos and they're taking it to the park and feeding the homeless. Or we're feeding, you know, um, one, of my, one of my friends uh, is buying about 120 bentos. He's gonna do a one day feed of all of the, uh, uh, you know, emergency ambulance services on the island. So they're gonna have volunteers picking up food from our restaurants and taking it out there. Um, we donate food on a pretty regular basis to the youth outreach program in Waikiki. And so we're gonna to continue to do things like that as well. Um, but donations are an opportunity to support your restaurant and your favorite restaurants and also support um, your community as well. So that may be an opportunity for, for folks that wanna take advantage of that to, uh, 
to you know share what they have. You know, if they're still in a good position financially, they may be able to help uh, restaurants and their community by doing that. Um, so that's kind of where the industry is at at this point. Um, so I'll be happy to. Oh, I got, I got a couple other um, things here. Hang on one second. Um, if you would like to know how you can can help restaurants um, and and I think one of the things we need a little bit of the most help with right now is a little bit of grace because so many restaurants are adjusting from serving people at their tables to changing over to takeout and it's a real challenge it's not easy to, you know to do that and so uh, if um, you're at your restaurant and it's taking a little bit longer than normal or or something's not quite right please be a little understanding we're going through changes and we're, we're trying to adjust to that uh, on the social high rise uh, website, which Social High Rise is a social media uh, management company that manages um, like your Yelp profiles and things like that. They got a really good um, video here about how you can help your, your uh, restaurants. It's a PSA. I'm not going to play it, but this gal here does a really good job of explaining what's really going on in restaurants right now and how you can help. Um, and then um, also too, Here's a website that uh, Roy Yamaguchi and his wife Denise put together with a, a variety of um, supporters here. They're all listed uh, somewhere on here. But in any event, you can go here and find all the restaurants or most of the restaurants that are actually doing, you know, delivery or pickup in your areas. And so here's a really another great opportunity to, um, to help restaurants. Uh, and, and find food in your area. So this is called Food A Go Go, and just type in Food A Go Go in your in your browser. It'll come up, and you can find great places to to get takeout meals or delivery. Okay. Okay. Are you taking questions now, Tom? I would be happy to. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put you back on speaker mode so we can see you. Um, I have one quick question before we go into the full Q and A is do you foresee, obviously there's like a lot of, um, trickle, like just effects across the entire mm -hmm. chain of folks who are, um, in the industry. So do you, do you foresee like a lot of restaurants closing indefinitely or do you see landlords kind of collectively reducing rent for restaurants? Like what kind of, what kind of things do you see as the long-term impacts that this could have on businesses or landlords or consumers and like okay. are consumers cooking more and is that making it hard for businesses to like get their sales back like i'm just curious what your thoughts are on that whole well thing. i think i think most people um are looking forward to a time when they can go back and behave as they did in the past and be together and commune that's just normal i mean there was the the spanish flu way way back when and you know that, that as time goes by people get back to their their normal behaviors um, and we're a really social, um, you know, community now. People are eating out more than ever. I know they're going to want to get back to doing that as soon as possible. But, um, you know, there probably will, as I mentioned earlier, even maybe some mandated restrictions on how close we can, we can be and so forth. But my guess, uh, na the National Restaurant Association is uh, telling us right now that at least 3% of restaurants um, are closing right now are not going to reopen. That's they're not planning on reopening. They're closing and they're basically closing forever. And the estimation is, is that that number is going to increase to somewhere north of 10%, maybe as high as 15% in the next, you know, two months. So it's going to depend on how well we can get back to, you know, what we consider normal sales as to how well we can do that. Restaurants operate on a very, very thin margin. Typical restaurants on the mainland are, are earning between, you know, five to 10%. And in Hawaii, it's more like two and a half to 5%. And, and actually 5% in Hawaii is pretty good. Um, and so when your margin is that small and your sales drops by even 10 or 15%, it's really, really difficult to make a profit. And so I think you're going to see quite a few, um, uh, you know, restaurants in, in Hawaii, you know, close and, and maybe not reopen. Um, that means that the restaurants that survive will, will, may have more meals. But I think, as I said earlier, it's going to take probably till well into 2021 before our sales comes back to the levels that we had uh, prior to this, you know, pandemic. And that's going to be really, really challenging for all of us. And I think, um, you know, when you think, I mentioned earlier about how many employees that is, that's almost 100,000, you know, people in this industry. And a great many of them are servers. And the economy for servers is that, you know, they live on tips. And a lot of people think that, you know, that, that, that that's a, maybe not very much money, but servers actually do quite well. 
And, um, you know, some of them, uh, many of them are, are like single moms. Um, it's a great, you know, job to have at lunchtime. You know, you can drop the kids off at school, go work a lunch shift somewhere, pick the kids up and, and make pretty good money. And uh, they count on that income. Uh, you know, it's, it's really important to them. Also, too, a lot of the, the servers that work for us additionally are like school teachers or, you know, they work for the, the, the government. They work at the Department of Transportation or somewhere. And the restaurant server job that they have two or three evenings a week is what helps them, you know, pay their mortgage or um, put their kids in, in private school or what have you. And so this, this you know, tip income is a huge part of our economy. And with the dining rooms closed, that's really, you know, shut that down. So not only is the, you know, the business industry affected, you know, significantly by this, but all of those that are, that are working, you know, on the floor serving food are really right now uh, doubly disadvantaged because, you know, minimum wage will cover, you know, their, their um, basic wage that we pay, but they really, um, you know, live on the tips that they earn. And it's, it's an awful lot of money for them. And it's an awful lot of money in the economy. So I think that's going to be a drag on the economy as well. Awesome. Okay, so we'll open up questions to anyone here. So feel free to add it to the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. So Tom Jones from HRA and Lauren Zerbel from Hawaii Food Industry Association are here to answer any questions. You can also share um, additional resources or comments if you have any. Uh, yeah, this is Peter. I'd just like to you know, add a comment. Uh, regarding uh, food safety, uh, the Department Department of Health right now uh, appears not to be doing regular uh, inspections. However, um, they are uh, investigating complaints. Um, you know, and usually what I'm seeing the complaints are, uh, you know, they didn't have ma uh, you know people in a restaurant didn't have masks on or they weren't following the social distancing. Um, so yeah, just remind your staff that is working. Hey, you know, it's a unusual time, but still we got to make sure we follow the rules. Um, but yeah, just be careful. You know, just be aware. I'm sure that once things loosen up, there's going to be a tor uh, torrent of inspections going around. Um, they ha I'm sure they have a huge backlog. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm very impressed with um, what I'm seeing at, at a lot of different restaurants and how creative the employees, just the line employees are, are being in terms of, you know, it, you know figuring out ways to um, adjust to the social distancing or removing steps in the process that would, you know, create hand-to-hand -hand contact, um, like moving the card swipes out onto the, you know, to the front of the counter so the customers can swipe their own card and they don't have to pass the card back and forth at the restaurant or having a jar of uh, sanitized pens and a jar that says used pens and, you know, you can use this, the sanitized pen and then put it in the other jar. Um, you know, I think people are really, really creative when, it, when they get in a situation like this and under, they're under pressure. And wherever I go, I'm seeing a lot more um, positive reactions to what's going on than negative ones. Certainly there are issues out there. And as, as I think, you know, as the um, stay at home thing gets a little, you know, farther along, I think people that stay at home a lot are going to be struggling with being cooped up. But by and large, I'm seeing, you know, really, really um, a lot of acts of generosity and grace and, and consideration um, and love out there. And it's very encouraging. So um, I, I don't know if that's just Hawaii or what, but there's a lot of aloha going on around out there and a lot of creativity and a lot of caring. And that's really encouraging to see. If you get, if you, my, my philosophy is if you get one act of kindness, go back to, you know, pay it forward two times. And uh, we're going to get through this and, and get through it very well, I think. I think that probably is more so in Hawaii, but I do feel like that's happening everywhere. So thanks mm. for bringing in that optimism. Mm. Um, and on that note, I want to ask Lauren a, a question on that. So what are, what are things that make you feel optimistic, Lauren? I know it's a really hard time for the food industry in terms of the numbers and all of that, but just curious what any silver linings that you might see or positive stories you can share. I mean, I feel optimistic that we're going to get through this eventually. Um, I think the question is just when. Um, but I, I think that, you know, eventually things will come back to normal. And we have really great people in the food industry, really solid, 
people who care about the community and they're really stepping up to provide food to the food bank and to, you know, volunteer and, um, and care for the community and, and advocate for, you know, um, increased funding for SNAP and things like that. Um, so I, I feel optimistic when I look at all the positive things that are going on and when I, and I'm actually on the board of directors for the Hawaii Food Bank and, and seeing the community outreach to the food bank right now has been really heartening. And, um, and I think that that's, that really says a lot about, about our community and, and, and that makes me feel hopeful. Awesome. Cool. Any other questions from folks on the on the webinar right now? Or comments or optimism or stories? <laughs> I do. Hi, everyone. I see a lot of friends over there. Hi, Lily. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, I like just piggybacking off like creative. Like I think in times of crisis, people really do get creative and like. With, I heard an idea like somebody has like oh like a taco like ice cream truck sort of thing like do you see any businesses kind of like getting creative like that and then if so like are there even regulations for that you're invented yet <laughs> like if somebody wanted to go around and like do I don't know like burritos like I don't know just being creative and bringing kind like what sort of like thing do you have you seen or like do you imagine if this lasts any longer like bringing it home to people like delivery kind. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would, I would say um, as, as uh, Matt is doing, you know, local foods, you know, local vegetables and local food trucks and stuff. I think that's a really great idea using bite squad to deliver local fresh ingredients to people's homes or to, to places where people can pick them up. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think food trucks um, represent a real opportunity to, to move food from place to place and serve, you know, interesting foods, um, and, 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 and like in our restaurant with our training, it's a little, it's a little diff, difficult because we're, you know, we have a kind of a standard menu, but if you've got a creative chef that's, you know, got flexibility and, and can adjust his prices and, and all that, I think a food truck or, or a small operation like that could certainly take local foods that are available today, create really great dishes out of them. The challenge is getting the word out. And I think that's where I think right now, social media is really, um, you know, changing the face of restaurants. <clears throat> we didn't have ordering online two weeks ago at Gyotaku restaurants, and now we do. And, and we made that change within probably five or six days. First, we were able to order online. And then within two or three days, you're actually able to order and pay online. And so, um, you know, th th those type of social media companies are out there reaching out to, to our, uh, our members and, and helping us, you know, some of us anyways, you know, stay alive and stay in the game. So that's really really important. Well, it sounds like there's a free idea from Lily about a taco ice cream truck. So I welcome anyone to <laughs> take that on. It sounds awesome. It can have a new I'm song. Just that we all know. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Thanks for Lily for jumping in there. Any other questions, yeah. comments, stories? I, I, maybe I'd just like to touch on the PPP program that, you know, the government has the CARES Act and Lauren mentioned that and most of her you know, members are really big. I think my restaurant, Matt, is, you know, mentioned that he was able to to uh, take advantage of that. Um, it, it's it, it's got a lot of great, you know, um, components to it. Um, basically, you take all your payroll costs, um, you know, for the for 2019 or depending on how long you've been open, you can make, you know, adjustments in your last like three months of sales and, and, and labor, but all of your labor costs and um, related, you know, insurance and, and things like that, you take, take your monthly average and multiply it by two and a half times and the government will give you a forgivable loan for that amount. And we can use that to pay our employees. Um, and if we, you know, use at least 75% of it for our employees, we can use 25% of it for some of our hard fixed costs like our rent, mortgage, or utilities. Um, the real challenge though is being able to get the money to the employees because we're supposed to be closed down <laughs> and not, you know, having our employees come to work. But if we pay them this money, then we can, we can um, you know, use the, the money for the other things. So it, it's really a challenge. Um, we're looking at bringing some of our employees back um, in, in small groups at different times in the day and also changing people's job descriptions and, and having them do things in the restaurants that 
they wouldn't normally do in preparation for reopening later on. So we're moving our managers into training and development and, and building you know, tools for our future and then having the line employees move in and, and take over some of the jobs that the manager is doing. So we're gonna try as best we can to get about uh, at least a third or over 50% of our employees back to work as soon as we can. But again, then we're asking them to, to go out into the, you know, into the public and to, um, you know, to, to come back to work. Um, and, and again, within the, you know, social distancing, you know, re, you know, requirements, but it's, it's a challenge. So the, the program has its, its, its strengths, but it also has its challenges. So hopefully we'll be able to navigate that and be able to use those funds to be able to keep our restaurants alive. No legislation is perfect. I continue to that's, learn. That's so. right. There's always um, bugs. Elizabeth, I saw you unmute yourself and maybe prepare to share something if you wanted to go ahead. Well, I just wanted to interject that, keep in mind with the PVP, also, you can also put in your medical premium. So if right, you're bringing exactly. your people back, mm -hmm. you can also include that. What you can't include is your 1.5% if you're already deducting that portion mm -hmm. of it. Right. So keep in mind, you can't bundle that portion in. But what a lot of people are not realizing that there is also a simultaneous program, which is the EIDL. And that is a completely separate program on the PPP. Mm -hmm. So even though you have the PVP, the EIDL, and that stands for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And that is not having anything to do with the PPP. So it's not payroll related. But that has to do with like your supplies. So right. if you have to order paper supplies, food, any of that type of thing, that's a $10,000 loan. And that again is a grant, non-payable, I mean, non-reimbursed. You don't have to, just have to show that you have that money. And that is another excellent one for small businesses. So don't you know, don't complicate the two. I mean, don't <laughs> interact the two because they right. are separately. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks Maggie. Appreciate that. We'll have Elizabeth yeah. here. Yeah, I was just going to, um, I was wondering if there were any uh, like set rules for restaurants. I went in somewhere today and there were like seven people working in a small space and not all of them were wearing masks. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> I didn't know if you guys had anything mandated or any rules that people were trying to follow generally. Yeah, no, I think I think as much as possible, at least in my in my restaurants, we're trying to follow the six feet and we, we've got people doing specific tasks to keep them apart. But of course, every business is different and the level of training or oversight is going to vary. I think Peter mentioned that a little while ago. So you need to pay attention as well as a consumer. And, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that you know, you're picking restaurants that you feel are, are um, you know, serving safe food all the time. And now more than ever, you need to be, you know, use your discretion and your good judgment when you see things. So, and, yeah, and Peter mentioned, I was very surprised when I yeah. saw it, actually, it wasn't a restaurant that I expected it in, <laughs> but I've been trying to like stick to like one restaurant mm -hmm. and just go there a lot, um, mm -hmm. you know, try to stay in like the same kind of community. But. It, it, I, I will say this though, as, as a restaurant owner, um, we always, at least I always appreciate, and I think most people do, hearing from our customers directly about things that we could improve on. Um, you know, we get Yelp comments, you know, that, that we've never had contact with the customer before, and they write a scathing review about your restaurant. Um, it's always, you know, it's always nice if you're a good neighbor and you go and you tell the restaurant door, just call them on the phone and talk to them. You know, you can Yelp them if you want, but you can also, um, you know, be um, a, a friend or, you know, if you care about them, you can deal with them directly and give them an opportunity to straighten those things out. So you may want to really send them, you may want to send them an email or a note and say, hey, I was over there the other day and it didn't, it, it, it didn't, I was not impressed and, you know, share your thoughts with them and, and then kind of peek in a week later and see what happens. I, I highly recommend that you, you know, help hold your rest, your restaurants accountable. Thanks for you, yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, yeah, just to add to that, um, masks are not required by the Department of Health, but 
they are suggested, recommended, uh, but a lot of it is, as you can kind of uh, say, perception. You know, uh, if you if you feel it's a clean restaurant and you know people are not working right, your perception of the restaurant is not going to be the same. So just you know, making sure everyone has gloves on and definitely recommended to wear uh, masks. Uh, that would you know in, improve everyone's perception of the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, I think gloves are a really interesting issue. Peter and I have talked about this many times, but um, gloves can also give people a false sense of security. Um, you can pick up something with a glove and transfer it to another glove or to another hand. But if you're washing your hands on a regular basis, for instance, a well-trained sushi maker would never make that mistake. They're always washing their hands. And, and actually, some of the solutions that they use are actually antibacterial. So you got to be a little bit careful about just assuming because someone's wearing a glove that that's sanitary. That's not always the case. Watch closely what they're touching and, and how they're touching it. Um, and I think that's a, a better indicator um, because you know, I've seen people with gloves on make really big cross contamination errors um, and they just feel like they got the gloves on. And if you're, if you have your bare hands, you're a lot more tactile. You can tell if there's some bacteria or, you know, there's some grime or something on your fingers. When you have gloves on, you cannot tell. So that barrier is not always a good thing. It doesn't always, you know, work in the right direction. But generally speaking, gloves are, are appropriate, particularly when you're, you know, carrying those bags and doing things like that. Awesome. Um, so we're coming up on our last minute. So I'd love if Tom and Lauren, you each share just some closing, closing thoughts for all of us. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> okay, I was gonna, I was gonna let ladies first. Lauren, but she, she muted herself. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, the, you know, the restaurant industry is a really, really important part of our, our culture and our community, and um, we're seeing that now. I think more than ever, when the, you know, when the governor shut us down, wham, the unemployment just rose up. You can see how much of an impact our industry has on the economy in general. And, you know, people basically eat three meals a day and they're eating more and more of those meals outside the home. So we're providing a really important service, um, you know, to the community. Um, and, and now more than ever, the restaurants need the support of the communities to stay alive and to be able to make it. So we're really counting on continued support. Um, it's challenging, I know, and, and uh, for many people, they've lost their income, so it's hard for them to eat out. We understand that. Um, but, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's about act of, acts of kindness. I'm not as concerned about my, my own restaurants. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to make it through this, you know, this situation with the help of the government and, and so forth. Um, but, um, you know, it's really about, this is a human, you know, um, you know, problem with, with, you know, far reaching financial, um, you know, impact. But the, re, the, the way to solve the financial impact is to go back to our humanity and, and, and be human about this thing. And that will solve the financial problem in the long run. Thank you, Tom, for bringing in your compassion and optimism. We really appreciate that energy. Okay, Lauren, closing thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar, DeRay. And um, yeah, I mean, this whole um, situation has been really devastating for a lot of people, but it's also kind of helped to change some perspective. And I think in the long term, this will lead to some lasting changes. Um, I think one of the big ones is e-commerce and food delivery and potentially people's attitude about um, you know, being in close spaces. And um, so I think that the, the food industry is changing and it will continue to change as a result of this. Um, you know, our concern is how long will this go on? And, and like Tom was saying, the smaller businesses are at a greater risk of closing permanently if this goes on for a very long time. And we really hate to lose our, our smaller businesses. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that, that the federal government and the state and county can work together to, to increase our testing and tracking and and try to get this under control so that we can we can all go back to something similar to normal and uh, I'm looking forward to that and and I think everyone else is too so thank you awesome thank you both for joining and um, I applaud you for your 
ability to adapt and work so hard in this crazy time. And I know you're working harder than most other people who are just at home and chilling a lot of the day. So um, great work. And yeah, let's continue to um, work together in the future. And please contact Surfrider Oahu if you have any requests for future webinar topics. I hope this was helpful to some of you and we'll be continuing to push out virtual content um, over the next month or so. Happy Earth Month, everyone. Um, hopefully we're all driving yeah, right. less and doing things that are a little bit lighter on the earth given the circumstance. Right. Yes. And, um, <laughs> the earth is healing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, that's definitely one of the silver linings I've been noticing. So um, mm. please stay safe and healthy, everyone. Wear your masks out there and try to get out in the sun. <laughs> so thank you so much and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, too, for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. I think so.